Hello and welcome back to my YouTube channel, which um, uh, is about books, mostly, and sometimes cats. Socks is here on my lap, although he's a bit restless today. Um, I have a yellow mug of coffee because in my um, uh, rainbow shelves survey, <laughs> it's, uh, I've got two yellow. I did a whole pile of red books yesterday. Now, this might seem like a very stupid way to organise a series of um, rambles through my bookshelf, but I like the randomness of it. So I'm doing this for a few videos. I'm going to talk about some yellow books. <laughs> and um, Socks is here to help. Come on, Socks, they can't see you sat there. Nope. Nope. Right. Oh, Nancy Drew. Here she is, resplendently yellow in her, um, these are reprints. I think I bought this in New York, I think. Um, they certainly had them there. They're so nicely done. This is The Secret of the Old Clock, the very first one. Now I read them to start with in Armada paperbacks in the 70s when they had um, covers that I think were from the TV show. Same with the Hardy Boys, though the Hardy Boys had nicely painted covers. Nancy Drew, of course, I read fewer examples of than the Hardy Boys, because when you grew up in a, a town like Newton Aircliffe and got books out of the town library, it was easier to not get beaten up, <laughs> to run around with books uh, about the Hardy Boys. It looked a lot less um, girly than running around with Nancy Drew. Um, uh, some of us got beaten up, <laughs> got, got um, <coughs> picked on anyway. This is the reason I didn't read things like Little Women or Jane Eyre or whatever um, until after college. Nancy Drew, an attractive girl of 18, was driving along a country road in her new dark blue convertible. She had just delivered some legal papers for her father. It was sweet of Dad to give me this car for my birthday, she thought and it's fun to help him in his work. I think that was, I, I came to that conclusion just recently about the Hardy Boys as well, that they, um, they were rich, I suppose. That's what was amazing. They had cars, they went on planes and um, had this wherewithal in the world and could go anywhere and do anything. I had no idea how old they were. They seemed like teenagers, I suppose they were. Anyway, I love, um, both series. Peanuts, uh, the sun's kind of on these books, I'll tilt them. This is a, uh, not the, this is an American edition of uh, Peanuts cartoons from the 60s, from Sunday papers. I think the 60s, the 70s was when uh, uh, kind of Peanuts and Schultz were at their height the editions we read as kids weren't landscape like this, and they weren't kind of artily produced, they were mass produced. There's an Easter egg cover, look, for the weekend, for this weekend, of um, You're On Your Own Snoopy, and they were published by Coronet in this country um, as little paperbacks like this. This is from the mid 60s. Both Jeremy and I had collections of these, and you would read them, look the way they set the things down the page. Read them just again, again, and again. I loved Charlie Brown and Snoopy. I still do. There's something, whoops, <laughs> I'm knocking everything over. There's, oh, just something about his line work that is, that is fantastic, so spare. And I read a brilliant piece about the reason that Charlie Brown is the perfect cartoon character, and it's because his face is notational. It's a mask, essentially. Um, it's you know two dots for eyes, eyebrows, a slight nose, and a, a just a, um, a short line for a, a mouth. And this piece, whatever it was I was reading, suggested that Charlie Brown's face is the sense we have of our own face from the inside. And so it encourages identification with that character. And that's why cartoons are the way they are, because they um, 
chime in with our own ideas of how it feels to be us from the inside. And I thought that was really compelling. Here's my edition of Dracula with its sickly yellow spine. Now, I've talked about this edition before, I think. It's the one that I read at university, one of the ten books I took with me, non-curricular books I took with me to university in 1988. And on those dark and stormy nights in um, Lancaster on campus, when I didn't feel like going to university bars and drinking beer <laughs> and doing all the stuff that you're meant to do, I read Dracula. People laugh at me for this. It's still one of the... Um, I think most immersive books I know, I think, because it takes us into these different voices and these different um, diaries and documents and you assemble the book yourself. That's very interesting. Those early detective -y novels, like the, the Wilkie Collins ones, those gothic novels, Frankenstein too, invite you to um, uh, Construe the story yourself from these from these documents. I've got a run of kids' books here because they're all yellow. Uh, this is a nice edition of The Cricket in Times Square by George Seldon, which I didn't discover till recent years. Um, it's set in the middle of New York, under Times Square, a newsstand owned by this couple. And we get there's a cat and a mouse and a cricket and it's their adventures in the subway and I just think a lot of this is about um, food and scavenging food from the commuters and I think at the end the, um, the whole of the paper stall burns down and it's tragic. There are a number of sequels about looking after lost puppies and going to the countryside and they're all marvellous. I think George Selden is a really lovely writer. And as if kind of as a mark of um, the canonicity, <laughs> the, the, um, the classic nature of this text, it's illustrated by Garth Williams, who did The Little House on the Prairie books and Charlotte's Web and his style to me conjures up kind of 20th century American classics. That's what they look like. I don't know if people know this book still. I don't know if it's um, celebrated as much as it should be. I was so pleased to get a nice copy of it though, on eBay, having a paperback somewhere that has been read into um, absolute obliteration. Here's an annual. Now this I got very cheaply and it's quite dear to buy. Misty Annual. Misty Comic. Welcome to my midnight world. Misty Comic was a girls comic in the late 70s. Again, something I couldn't have been seen dead with in our town. <clears throat> but it was spooky stories. It was a kind of spooky bunty. That's what Misty was. And it's every kind of story you can imagine. Historical, ghosty, um, horror, torture, voodoo. There's a six-page piece on voodoo in a kid's annual. I love it. It allowed them to explore all kinds of stories and characters. Um, and I was delighted to find out all about Misty, which I did in later life. Dracula's Dream Dessert. There's even recipes, how to make spooky desserts with fangs and raspberry puree. Fangs made out of bananas. Um, there was a boy's version called Scream in the mid-80s, which only lasted 17 pages because it was so gory and so dark and violent. And I loved it. I did at the time. At the age of 15, 16, read all of Scream. And I wish I still had them because they go for a lot of money now as well. And they're hard to get hold of. Although there is a huge volume just about to come out of all of Scream comic. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to invest in it. I don't know. Probably not. I'm on not a book buying ban, but a cheap book buying <laughs> um, drive, perhaps. Um, 
as I said, I'm not I'm not a collector who spends kind of huge amounts. I haven't got huge amounts to spend. Um, Misty, of course, has been reprinted in various forms um, by the same publisher, I think. Rebellion, I believe they're called. And they do fantastic things. Um, you should check them out. I've bought The Leopard of Lime Street, which was a, a kind of British superhero comic strip set in the north that came from, I forget which comic that was in, but I loved it. And I did get the collected edition from Rebellion. Some of these things aren't aren't as good when you go back to them. I think Misty would be. Just look at that. It's amazing. Anyway, right. Folk of the Faraway Tree, Enid Blyton. I've talked before. Sorry, the Magic Faraway Tree. This, I think, is the second. I get them mixed up. Um, Dick Comes to Stay. I think it might be the second one. The one with the Land of Toys. And uh, everything comes right. It's the penultimate chapter. That's very, very Enid Blyton, isn't it? Everything comes right. It's okay. And I guess reading her books, you knew that it was going to be okay by the end of it. Whatever hair-raising adventures everybody went off on, they'd be home in time for tea. These editions um, from Dean um, were around in the 70s and 80s, and everything that she did, I think, was published in these. They're lovely little hardbacks, um, produced very cheaply. I think they were they were pocket money prices, and we would buy them from our toy shop in our town. Um, Hardings, it was called, and it was up the ramp. Our town was a kind of minimalist, um, concrete, brutalist sculpture on layers, on levels, with ramps and twirly bits. Most of it's knocked down now. The one in Peter Lee, a similar town nearby, is preserved. Aircliff, it was just, they knocked it down to pieces. Hardings was up the ramp and it was a wonderful toy shop, a family owned toy shop. And Mr. Harding, I think he was, that was his name, had a, a Christmas club for all the mothers to pay money into each week. And they, were, they had huge, deep wooden drawers that toys were put away in. Um, and they'd be paid off week by week. And there was something magical about all of that. And he had a couple of rows of books, and they were all of the Dean books, which had these colourful spines and this kind of tactile, these hardbacks that were... Um, Tactile and paper that was very pulpy inside, and all of Ina Blyton was there. I think other authors as well, I'm not sure. But for a time, in the 70s, there hardly were any other authors. There was Ina Blyton, there was Roald Dahl, and there was Terence Dix and his Doctor Who books. Right, Eric Thompson, though, was around then. The, whoops, the yellow spine here. This is a fantastic, fantastic book, and I got this... Uh, very cheaply in uh, the Wirral on a safari, charity shop safari last year. Anything about the Magic Roundabout you must collect because it was the funniest TV show. Very subversive. It was a tea time um, stop motion animation from France, but rewritten and voiced by Eric Thompson, who would give it a kind of subversive gleam. There was it was very um, droll, that's what it was. This is the, a, n a number of stories, not from the TV. Uh, I wish I could get the full colour version of this because the, the illustrations are not done justice to in, um, <laughs> in this, the very grey scale. And you can see at some point there was a psychedelic edition that I wish I could find. Look at them, there's the characters on a flying carpet. Oh, this is why it was 50 pence. All the pages fall out. Can't beat a carpet. Do you get it? Carpet beating. Oh, never mind. Get on. He started to laugh again, muttering, can't beat a carpet to himself. Oh, we've got a right one here, whispered Dougal. They all got on. Although the carpet seemed to be quite small, there was plenty of room for everyone. George sat at the front, Dougal, Brian and Florence in the middle, and Dylan and Ermintrude the cow 
at the back. Ready, said George. Ready, they said, a little nervously. Right then, we'll be off, said George, and the carpet rose slowly into the air and set off through the sky across Paris. George took them on a little circular tour so they could have a look around. They saw the churches and the bridges and the river and the stations and the parks. No one seems to be taking much notice, said Florence, looking down. It's because we're British, said Dougal. They like that, the French. Oh, said Florence. They flew on over Paris and south across France. It was beautifully warm with just a little breeze and the carpet made no noise at all. Suddenly, Brian the snail gave a great whoop and started to roar with laughter. The others looked at him in surprise. What's your problem, mollusk? said Dougal coldly. Can't beat a carpet, wheezed Brian. Oh, that's very good. He he, can't beat a carpet. Ho ho, he he. Dougal sighed. What has the world done to deserve him? He muttered, and they sped on southwards through the evening sky. Somebody told me they got told off for calling their little brother Mollusk all the time, and it all came from the way Dougal treated Brian in the Magic Roundabout. And that whole thing of Brian getting the story late, getting the joke late, really reminds me of uh, Jeremy and his dad. He would tell his dad jokes on the phone, and um, his dad would go, oh yes, hilarious, never get them. And then he'd phone at three in the morning laughing hysterically because he'd just got the joke. He was... Um, he slept badly at this point in his life, and so he'd be up all night roaming the house, and suddenly he'd think why the joke had been funny. Phone up and leave a message of just laughter that we'd wake up to. This is a kid's book that uh, I think I bought in Paris, I think. It's an American book, though. A Funny Thing Happened at the Museum by... <clears throat> I can't read that. <laughs> it's in handwriting, and it's... Hang on. Oh, it's David Carley and Benjamin Show, and it's published by um, Chronicle Books out of San Francisco and everything I've read from them. And they have that distinctive logo of the eyes looking out of glasses. Everything I've, I've, I've read from them has been gorgeous, really beautifully illustrated, really nicely made. This is uh, the story of a kid let loose in an art gallery. Well, there's lots of stuff about art. Yeah, everything in this is delightful. It's only recent, I think. Um, only in recent years. He tidies the whole museum up. That's what he does. Yeah, that's a great... A great little kid's book. Now, um, I'll have to hurry up. This is a novel that came out last year, just by looking at him, by Ryan O'Connell. Uh, it was sent to me by a friend who thought I'd like it, and I did. It's really rude. <laughs> um, it's, it's full of gay sex, and it's uh, a fella who's quite happy in his life, who's a writer on a TV show, a comedy show, who's very snappy and funny, but he starts um, seeing a hustler and falls for, the, for this uh, male prostitute. And it's absolutely filthy. <laughs> He's a bit clever, clever. He's a bit smart arsey in the way that, that people around American TV who have to uh, live in this ecosystem where they top each other's um, lines all the time and you know, are wisecracking all the time. That can get wearing in books as it can in life. But it's it's a um, yeah it's it's well worth a read. Ryan O'Connell, Carol Matthews, who I don't think I've talked about yet. She has a yellow book. This is a um, a spring-like book, happiness for beginners. A few years ago, um, she published this, and then there was a sequel. Molly Baker is living her best life, 38 years old and running Hope Farm as an alternative school for children surrounded by uh, mostly four-legged friends. Sorry, the school where she lives is surrounded by mostly four-legged friends, not a school for children who are surrounded by. That's a dangling modifier, I think. 
it's full on. But she wouldn't have it any other way until one day the well-groomed and distractingly handsome Shelby Dacre turns up asking to enrol his son, Lucas. It's amazing how the characters come back to life in your head when you read the blurb and remember them. Because uh, she lives in a caravan, I think, on the site. Could letting them in be a terrible mistake or the start of something wonderful? Well, of course it's something wonderful. It's a, it's a romance and it's comic and silly. And she surrounds her uh, hero and heroine with all kinds of eccentric characters and, in this case, animals. And it's again, it's a very... Um, it's a world you want to go back to. That's the thing with Carol's books. And I've read lots of them over the years since I became a fan. Um, and this is... Uh, it's actually partly based on a, on a um, on the work of Animal Antics, which is a uh, yeah, it's it's a not a company, a charity I think that that uh, is all about animal assisted learning. And we went, we visited once to see the uh, the llamas and the baby goats and all the animals. I was going to say pashminas, but they're not called that. They're called alpacas. For some reason, I mix up the word um, pashmina and alpaca, but try wrapping an alpaca around your neck and you'd know about it. Another yellow spine. Spider-Man Annual 1977. Nothing says Marvel Comics to me more than that. You can get as glitzy and as filmy and as uh, fancy as you like, but this from World Distributors in 77. Look at these end papers with a um, a collage of all those characters. I used to pore over this and try and draw them all to see uh, Werewolf by Night and Mephisto alongside the Enchantress and Nighthawk and Luke Cage and Dracula and Kill Raven the Hunter all together and the Falcon and the Secret the Silver Surfer and Conan. It's such a ragbag of different characters. And it makes you think of the ones they haven't filmed yet. Uh, maybe they'll do them all in the end. This annual is one long story, I think, or mostly one long story. And it's the one in which he, it's a kind of time travel thing, or it's a story set over two eras. And you have an adventure in the past with um, Doc Savage, who wasn't even a Marvel character. But they clearly got the rights to him. Um, the uh, bronze-skinned 1930s uh, detective. And Spider-Man has a, uh, an adventure in the present. And somehow it all meets up in the middle. That was kind of fascinating to me as a kid that you could have these parallel stories going on. Right, last yellow book is Michael Foreman's version of Alice in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I have many, many copies of Alice, many different illustrated versions, and Foreman is someone I've followed for many years. His take on Alice is as lovely as you'd expect. Clearly, a, a, um, what they call nowadays a passion project, but, you know, a labour of love. With him, you can, the paper always feels wet still. You feel as if you're about to touch actual watercolour paper, heavy and glossy with water and, and colour. As if it's still drying and you've got to be very careful with it. Somewhere I've got his first book which is uh, all in inks, I think, colourful inks, about a bus at Christmas that flies over London from 69. This is from, uh, I think it's quite recent, actually, this. Mm, 2004, 20 years, still 20 years old. Anyway, it's a lovely take on it. Such a hard thing to do, to, um, wow, to even think about doing Alice in your own style, but I think he does it with great verve. And, uh, yeah, I've been obsessed with Alice for many, many years. Um, and in this last year, I've, I've written my Doctor Who book that, that dips into that mythology, which makes me very happy.
to have done my own version in my own way. I just wish there, there was space for drawings in it as well. Maybe there should be. Anyway, I've gone on too long. I'm going to stop. Um, Socks is cleaning himself <laughs> very busily. He's a very clean and proud cat. He, um, when I read though, he looks at me, which is very funny. Right, I'm going to go press like and subscribe and we will see you again soon. Goodbye.